we want to thank you for making it to church everyone we have many of you this morning i don't see any new faces but i see old faces which were not coming in welcome to church amen amen Yes, that's your chance. <laughs> right, does anyone have a word for us before we start? A word of encouragement? Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. I felt the powerful reminder as we were singing the song that I was saying, while I'm waiting, I'm not waiting. Because I know heaven is a Lord. And I just felt as if the Lord was encouraging me. So that I can encourage you to let you know that you don't have to worry for heaven. Heaven comes to earth that it is on the inside of you. So whatever you want, you can pray about it. You don't have it. We are in the kingdom. You reminded me of Mrs. Mike's message uh, on the kingdom. We are in the kingdom, saints. We are ready today. So don't wait for the sweet by and by when you're old and then you die and then you say, ah, why are you in heaven? Heaven is in you. All we just to, all need to do is to believe and receive and start living in heaven here on earth. Amen. Thank you, thank you so much. Nice to meet you for encouraging way. Amen. Amen. Right, we are Grace and Faith Fellowship. That's the name of our church. Um, we exist to love God and to love His people and to serve them both. Amen. Uh, can I take this opportunity to release the kids to kids ministry? Right. So it's um so welcome to church once more. Uh, today our minister again needs no introduction. Uh, she's a powerful woman of God. And she continues with the series that we started last week, which is the, the promise, the power, and the purpose of the Pentecost. Amen. I think I was blessed so much last week, and I cannot wait for the message this week. So may you please help me welcome Pastor Mark. So that we all get an understanding of this all too important day in our lives. 
and we begin to celebrate it every day because for us, for the New Testament church, every day can be Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And we see from the passages of scripture that we're going to read today that Pentecost didn't just happen once. They were, they were not just baptized with the Holy Spirit once. They continued to be filled. So we can have Pentecost every single day. Any moment when you feel like you want the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you can be filled anew. Okay? So, last week we started off by uh, highlighting the four great events in, uh, in the Christian calendar today. Great events with the eternal significance. They were? Christmas. And at Christmas we celebrate God with us, right? Easter we celebrate God God as us. Easter, uh, Good Friday is God as us. That's when Christ died as us. That's when he substituted his life for ours on the cross. That's when he paid the price that we could never, ever pay it, right? Um, there's a song that we used to sing in the union. He said something like, He paid the price, he I owe the debt. I could not wait, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. How sweet the sound, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never Hallelujah. I didn't know we have songs, songsters and songstresses. <laughs> so, so Good Friday is when we celebrate Christ dying as us, right? And when we say Easter Monday is when we celebrate Christ being raised from the dead for our justification, right? It's, it, the Bible says we were not found justified until he was raised from the dead. Until he, there was proof that he had fully paid the debt, we could not be justified. And then Pentecost, we celebrate God in us. So we, we, we trace the journey of God coming to earth and concluded that the end that he always had in mind was to make yourself and myself his dwelling place. So that, that, that was the purpose of Christmas, Good Friday, Easter. Pentecost was the purpose of all those special days, right? We, we spoke about how God's plan has not changed right from the get-go, that he has always wanted to manifest himself through men, right from the Garden of Eden, even up to today. He wants to manifest himself on earth through us. And we read from Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 11, where God says, My counsel shall, shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling the bed, bed of prey from the east, the men who execute my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I will also do it. This is what he has always wanted to do. To make yourself and myself his dwelling place of heaven. And then he Job 42 verse 2 in the Amplified says, I know that you can do all things, and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained or thwarted. So God is saying, I set out to make men my dwelling place. That has always been my, my plan, and that has always been my purpose, that has always been my thoughts. And none of those will ever be restrained or thwarted. Okay? We quoted from Miles Mango again, one of my favorite, because the end of all things will be discovered in the beginning of all things. What is the end of all things? That the earnest expectation of the creation which awaited the manifestation of the sons of God may one day rise up and say, these are the sons of God. So, as long as we are not manifesting Jesus, creation is waiting. Do we get that? Creation is waiting on you and I. And by creation, I just don't mean the trees and the stones and whatever. There are people who are waiting on you and I to show up as sons, to show up and manifest God who's dwelling in our hearts. So that they too can come to salvation and um, begin to live in the life of sonship that we have also experienced. And so we say we also trace back to the Garden of Eden who concluded that God has always wanted his sons to manifest him on earth. You remember that? Adam was the son of God. Do we do we know that? Do we know that the first Adam was the son of God? Okay, you can go home and read from Luke 3, verse 23 to 
about 24 something there, where the Bible talks about it, it, it's tracing the genealogy of Jesus, and then it goes, it talks about Anaseth, Anani, Anani, and then it goes on to say, then uh, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So they are tracing the genealogy back to the Garden of Eden, and the first Adam is referred to by Luke as the son of God. Okay? So for Adam, God wanted to manifest himself in Adam, the son of God in the garden. So when he gives Adam the mandate to rule and to reign, he's just simply saying, I want to rule on earth through you. I want to manifest my presence on earth, my power, my glory on earth through you. We know what Adam did. Then came the, same, the last Adam, the son of God with a capital of S, who is Jesus Christ. And what is Jesus saying? If you've seen me, so he was the perfect manifestation of God here on earth. So we see God's mind has not changed concerning his sons, right? And now you and I are we are sons of God, right? So if God's intention for the first Adam was to manifest his presence here on earth through him, and if his intention for the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ, was to manifest himself on earth through him, what is his intention for you and I? But you, you are not convinced. <laughs> you are not convinced. I thought last week we convinced each other. Anyway, so we concluded last week that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which all happened on the, on the day of Pentecost, was the will of the Father, the work of Christ, and the witness or manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right? We said the Father is the one who promised. Jesus is the one who delivered or who executed on the Father's promise. And then we said the Holy Spirit is the one who seals the Father's promise in our hearts, right? Um, now we want to, to do a case study of the disciples, the before and after. Have you, have you ever seen this? Um, I used to watch this program a long time ago. It was called The Extreme Makeovers. Mm -hmm. um, yes, for homes. You, you see the before and the after. You can't, you, you can't, they, they don't relate, right? So today we're going to do the before and after of the disciples. Before Pentecost and after Pentecost. And we're going to see the extreme makeover which that day did, uh, made in their lives on the day of Pentecost. So in John 6, verse 60 to 61, Uncle Mo. John 6, verse 60 to 61. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a difficult teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this teaching, Jesus asked, Does this offend you? Amen. So this is um, a snippet from the life of the disciples as they walked with Christ. I just picked that verse because I wanted us to see the attitude of the, of the disciples before Pentecost, right? It's, it's telling us here that the disciples were grumbling. The disciples were grumbling, right? They were saying, oh, this is so difficult, Jesus, what you're expecting of us? It's impossible, we can't do it. They were, they were grumbling, right? And so I'm calling them the grumbling disciples. <laughs> <laughs> the grumbling disciples, they are walking with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's been walking with them and he's been doing miracle after miracle after miracles. And he's just saying, you can do this too, and then they start to grumble, right? So are they... Am I in order to call them the grumbling, grumbling disciples? Yes. <laughs> I hope I, I hope we don't relate. I hope we're not, they are not in good company when they are with us, right? <laughs> so we see that they were grumbling. Okay, this is before Pentecost, right? We are doing um, a before and after, right? We are we are doing we are, we, are, we want to show the extreme makeover that happened on the day of, of Pentecost, right? So we are starting with the before, okay? So we say they started off as the grumbling disciples, right? John, uh, John, Matthew 26, verse 26, Uncle Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will scatter. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Amen. So we hear, this is the night uh, before Jesus was betrayed. Uh, and then uh, he's, he's telling them that this is what's going to happen, right? 
they are going to strike the shepherd and the, the, the sheep are going to be scattered. And it is, it is and because of fear, it, we, are, we are told here that the disciples forsook him and fled. Right? So they started off by grumbling when he was still in when he was still ministering. Now his death is imminent. They fled, right? So is are we in order if we call them the fleeing the cycles? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Peter and John are liking this so much today. <laughs> so there were the fleeing disciples. This is the before, right? We are talking about the before. So it's like, you know, the grumbling disciples. Now they are the fleeing disciples, right? Luke 24, verse 9 to 11. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And the word seemed to them like idol tales, and they did not believe them. Now they are the doubtful disciples. <laughs> In spite of the fact that Jesus had been telling them that he was going to be raised from the dead on the third day, right? If you go through the scriptures, he had told them over and over and over again. But when the, when, when the report came from the ladies, ladies, any ladies in the house? Yes. Ladies were the first ministers after the resurrection, right? Yes. We are the ones to whom the word of grace was entrusted. And we went to the hiding and the fleeing and the doubtful disciples, and they did not believe, right? And so now we can call them the doubtful disciples, right? So they started off as the now they are this is the before right okay John 20 verse 18 to 19 uncle Mary, Mary uh, Magdalene came reporting to the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her so when it was evening on that same day the first day of the week though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace to you. Amen. So they started off as the grumbling disciples. <laughs> then they became the fleeing disciples. Then they became the doubtful disciples. Now they are the fearful disciples. <laughs> they are special, right? <laughs> this is the before, okay? We said we're doing the before and the after, right? Just so that we can see how important this day of Pentecost was to their lives and to ours. John 6, verse 66, From that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went to walk with him. Amen. So can we call them the deserting disciples? Mm -hmm. They are earning a lot of names and titles, right? Like the PhDs and the HMDs and what. They, they, they are very qualified, this one, right? They, they are very qualified. They are the grumbling disciples, the fleeing disciples, the doubtful di disciples, the, the fearful disciples. Now they are the deserting disciples. And it's amazing how they went back to their old ways. They, they, they did a full they did a full circle. <laughs> they did a full circle. If you, okay, let's just read from John 2, 21, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says they turned back to their old ways, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when Jesus called them out, they were fishing, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, I will make you fishers of men, right? So he took them from their fishing boats and tried to train them into ministry so that they could begin to fish for men, right? Now we find them back in their fishing boats. <laughs> This is after Jesus has died and is resurrected. They went back to the fishing to their fishing um, profession, and it says after these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who were the sons of Zebedee? Remember who, who were they? James and John, right? And two others. So in total there are seven disciples listed there, right? And we know that in total there were how many disciples? Twelve. There were twelve, right? And then Judas fell away, leaving eleven, right? Mm -hmm. And seven of the eleven are kept are captured in this scene. Can we see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it, it goes on to say, 
Um, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Okay? <laughs> he says, I'm going back. He should have just said, I'm going back to fishing. Right? And then they said, we are going also. That side was right. And then the Bible says, they went out and immediately got into a boat. And that night they caught nothing. So the disciples went back to where they started. Okay? This is the before, right? We are talking about the before. We, we said we are doing an extreme makeover session here today. And uh, by the time we finish, we are going to sell the house. And Memo is going to help us sell the house. Okay? <laughs> because it will look so beautiful and attractive. The before and after, right? And so, we are saying this to say, he, the disciples, having walked with Jesus, having seen all the miracles, having witnessed the Son of God, being the Son of God, having witnessed the manifestation of God through the last Adam, Jesus, still went back. They still went back. Okay? And one of the, one of the, um, one of the disciples, um, Peter, actually, in the, in the book that he later wrote after being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? The after Peter wrote this book. And he says, we saw him, right? He says, we handled him. He says, we were with him on the Holy Mount, right? And we saw him transfigured, etc., etc. And he says, we experienced him. But he still went back. He still went back. So it, it's it takes more than us just having a sensual relationship with Jesus. It takes more than us having a sensory perception of who, of the person of Jesus Christ. Right? It takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit. And that's what, that's what we're going to see today. That after they received the Holy Spirit, they got a revelation which caused them to go back to the Word of God. Right? Um, we want to look at the at the lying disciple. Who is the lying disciple? Peter is the lying disciple, right? <laughs> okay. Matthew 26, verse 69 to 74. Uncle Mo. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with Jesus in the lion. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those around, were well, standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a kiss a case for me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. Immediately the booster called. So I mean what <laughs> when we call him the lying disciple, right? Yeah. He's even lying about lying. <laughs> <laughs> this one is special, right? <laughs> he's lying about lying, right? So he is the lying disciple, right? But he's the same disciple who wrote the book of Peter. He's the one who then who, who, who starts to teach us but we have a more sure word of prophecy. What happened between this Peter and the Peter that we see in the book of Peter? There's something that happened, right? We can see an extreme makeover there. From the lying Peter to Peter on whom this rock of the revelation of Christ as the, as the Son of God was entrusted. Something happened, right? Something happened. Okay, fast forward. So the, uh, all this happened before Christ died and rose again, right? Um, now we fast forward. Christ has risen. The Bible says for forty days he walked with them, right? Uh, after the resurrection. Okay, are we together? Christ walked with them for forty days, right? And then before he ascended to heaven, that's when he gave them instruction an instruction pertaining to the baptism of the Holy Spirit which was going to happen on the day of Pentecost. So we're going to take it up from there now. We we'll, we'll fast forward it quite a bit. I think we've understood how these disciples were disciples. Whichever way you want to skin the cat, right? Okay, so now we want to see 
The commandment of Jesus just before he ascended into heaven. Acts 1, verse 4 to 5, and then 8 and 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Amen. So from that passage of scripture, we can see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a command. It was not a suggestion. It was not a maybe, maybe not. It was a command, right? So from that passage, and when we read from the Amplified, it says he commanded them to wait for what the Father had promised. Um, say, you shall be baptized with, you shall be placed in, you shall be introduced to the Holy Spirit, but you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the outermost, outermost parts of the earth. And so Jesus is saying, before you can go out to be my witnesses, you need this. This is the makeover that you're going to need. Because of all people, Jesus knew that his disciples were fearful, they were lying, they were they were going to desert him, etc, 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 and they were going to go back to where they had started, right? He knew that. And he knew that he knew they were they had no capacity to represent him after his ascension, unless and until they received power from on high, right? So this is the makeover that had the extreme makeover that happened. On that day of Pentecost, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts two, verse one to six. We want to we want to capture the scene. Okay, imagine we are in a movie, right? We want to capture the scene. The, the disciples are assembled in the upper room, right? We say they are the grumbling disciples. They are the fearful disciples. They are the fleeing disciples. They are the lying disciples. They are the deserting disciples, right? That's that's. The and that was in the upper room, right? And then this thing happened. The Bible says, Uncle. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, they came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing night wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they, they appeared to them divided tongues, as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to, began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterances. And they were, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Amen. So the Bible is telling us that there was a sound as of a rushing wind. It, it doesn't say there was a wind, right? It says there was a sound as of a rushing wind, which means the sound was noticeable. Right? Because if the if 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 the writer could equate it to the rushing wind, it means he's trying to tell us that people noticed that something like wind is happening here, right? And then the Bible also says they were they appeared to them tongues as of fire, which means it was a, an unforgettable scene, right? Mm. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it caught their attention, right? It caught their hearing and it caught their sight, mm. right? And then the Bible says, then they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, meaning it was miraculous. Mm -hmm. So it was noticeable, it was unforgettable, and it was miraculous, right? But as noticeable as it was, by way of the sound of a rushing wind, as unforgettable as it was by way of the tongues uh, as of fire, the most important thing, the most important, um, the substance of that occasion was something that was not said. Can we see that? It's not what was said that made that day <coughs> special. It was not the sound as of a rushing wind. 
It was not the terms as of fire that made that day stand out. What made that day stand out is what happened inside the heart of the man. That is what made it. That was the makeover. The makeover was not in the... I'm trying to say, the makeover was not in the sound of a rushing wind. The makeover was not in the tongues as of fire. As spectacular as it was, because I know that these days, a lot of people are looking for the spectacular. They want things that are like <coughs> very exciting, very, very spectacular. <laughs> but what they saying, the spectacular was just to capture the attention of those who lived by the flesh. Can we see that? <coughs> what God, the work that God was really doing on that day was not to be perceived through the senses. What happened with the sound of the rushing wind, the, the tongues as of fire, was just to capture the attention of those that were of the onlookers, if you want to put it that way, right? The most significant uh, aspect of that day is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the substance of the day of Pentecost. And that is when the makeover happened, right? So we want to go on to see, um, to, to study a little more what that passage is saying to us. In Exodus verse 4, in the Amplified, it says they were all filled. They were di diffused throughout their souls with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other different foreign languages, tongues, as the Spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression. Wow. It says they were like, they were, yeah, you know, you know those diffusers that you put in the bomb? That, that emits some frequencies every once in a while. That's what happened to them. They were diffused with the Holy Spirit. Throughout, the Bible says, throughout their souls with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with different tongue, uh, tongues or languages. And the Spirit kept giving them. So the Spirit started giving them and he kept giving them. Happens, right? So, what do we understand by the way by the word "feel" that was used there? It means they were saturated. I want you to imagine a sponge. You know a sponge? When you dip it in water and then you pull it out, what happens? And the dripping means what? It's saturated. It's saturated, right? So it won't drip until it's Right? So the disciples could not go on and disciple others until and unless they were completely saturated. Can we see it? Um, another uh, definition of that word feels under the influence. Have you ever seen anyone under the influence of drugs? I saw some yesterday. <laughs> I saw some people, some, some elderly ladies, I'm completely zonked. Um, have you ever seen anyone under the influence? <laughs> How do you know that they are under the influence? <laughs> what's the easiest? How? How? What's the easiest way? The behavior. Okay, so if if we are just sitting there like this, like a zombie, like I saw those ladies yesterday, we are just sitting there like this, like a zombie. When they were sitting, I couldn't tell the result, right? <laughs> but when they started talking, <laughs> have, you, uh, uh, have you ever talked to a person who's drunk? <laughs> you can tell the moment they open their mouths, right? You can tell they're drunk, even if they look so somber and were sober and whatever, as long as their mouths were closed. The moment they start to talk, you can tell this person is completely intoxicated, right? And so the Bible is telling us here that the disciples were so drunk with the Holy Spirit, they started to speak. <laughs> they started to speak, right? And they, they, when they spoke, they didn't speak what they wanted to speak. They spoke what the Spirit wanted them to speak. Which means they were completely and utterly under the influence, just like those ladies. Except the intoxication was coming from a different direction, right? <laughs> so, 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 so they, 
they were saturated and they became under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are talking about the disciples now. This is the conversion that changed them over to disciples, right? Um, in, in the Amplified, it says they were all filled, that is, diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, different languages, as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. Okay? So what is the first significance of the day of Pentecost? Open book exam. Thank you. Men became the dwelling place of God again. Men became the dwelling place of God again. But there's something that I want us to pick up from that passage of scripture. They received the ability to tap into the supernatural. They receive the ability to tap, they, they receive the ability to bypass their senses. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Do, we, do we see that? Because what, when they were speaking, the Bible says they were not speaking Galilean language. They were speaking languages from Crete, from all these other places, which is why the hearers were so perplexed. Because they said we are all hearing them speak languages from our own places, right? And so we can see here that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, right, God came and took habitation in them, and God started to ma manifest through them first through the tongues. The tongues were the first manifestation of God dwelling in them. Can you see that? We are not convinced. <laughs> tongues were the first outpouring of the indwelling of God. In these disciples, right? They, they stop. Peter stopped lying, right? <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all that Peter could do was, we will see later on that when they were speaking in tongues, they were glorifying God, right? So the, the liars stopped lying, right? And they started to speak and manifest the truth about God is coming from this inner man, from the spirit man, right? And so, it's in the same way that those disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit in the upper room, God wants the same for all of us. In. He wants us to be consumed or to be saturated or to be infilled or to be under the influence of the, or to be diffused with the Holy Spirit from the inside out. That is how we are going to manifest God or Christ here on earth, right? Um, in Acts 2, verse 5 to 8, we read. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the much multitude came together and were confused because everyone had them speak in his own language. Then they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are, are not all these who who speak Galileans, and how is it that we hear each one in our, in our own language in which we were born? And we hear them speaking in our own language the wonderful works of God. Amen. So from fleeing, from grumbling, from lying, from deserting, from, what are the other aims? From the doubting, from the fear, from being fearful. The Bible is telling us that after that experience in the upper room, they started to speak in different languages the wonderful works of God, right? So for Peter, from denying Christ, he now is speaking the wonderful works of God. And what is what had happened? The extreme makeover had happened. They had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's like they were changed into another, other men, right? They became totally different from what we have seen in the before picture, right? Acts 2, verse 7 to 12, it says, and they were all filled and amazed, they, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are all these who speak, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elimatis, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and some parts of even Africa, Libya, and Cyrene. Um, 
visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own languages the wonderful work of God. And so they were all amazed and they were all perplexed. So we can see from that passage of scripture that these people are beginning to have an encounter with God, right? Because of the disciples who were infilled with the Holy Spirit. These, the, 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 the people from all those places who witnessed this event and who heard these people speaking in languages that are not their own, that are not their ethnic languages, are, having an, are beginning to have an encounter with God. God is now manifesting to these other people through these disciples who were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So this is the after picture that we are going to follow now. Before we said they were grumbling, fearful, etc, etc. Now we can see that after the makeover, all they are speaking are the wonderful works of God. Can we see that? Okay. Um, they spoke the wonderful work of, of the wonderful works of God. And now we want to follow Peter. Peter and John, I think the one that we really want to follow is the lying one. The lying dancer. Okay. <laughs> who, who, who gets glimpses of, of John as we go along. But the one that we really want to make our case study today is Peter, right? Acts 2, verse 14, 22 to 24, then 32 to 33. But Peter, standing up with the leader. So Peter and John are going to the temple, right? And the Bible says they pass through the gate called Beautiful. And it says, but Peter, standing up with the left and raised his... Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is not the scene that we're talking about. Peter is, man, is, is explaining to the authorities what has just happened. Because um, some people were saying, well, they were drunk, they've been drinking all night, etc., etc. So Peter is standing... The Bible says, Peter, standing up with the left and raised his voice to, to them and said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Remember, this is the Peter who was so scared of the girls, of, of the maid, maids, right? He was scared, scared of the little girls. Okay? Remember, this is the this is the same Peter, okay? We are not talking about a different Peter. We are talking about the same Peter who who was so fearful of little maid, maid little maids, right? <laughs> Now he's saying to these authorities in Jerusalem, hear my words. What happened? Makeover. The extreme makeover, right? This is, a, this is the result of the extreme makeover. He says, hear my words, men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, I don't think this thing is Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, he being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by your lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. This is the same Peter who was very scared, who was lying about lying, right? <laughs> <laughs> but now he's saying, I'm talking about the Jesus that you killed. He's talking to authorities here, right? He's not talking to, to the little girls anymore. <coughs> he's, he's, he's talking to the big league, right? He says, um, you, you took him with your lawless hands. You crucified him and put him to death. God raised him, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it by death. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses, <coughs> therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see today. Can you relate this Peter to the other Peter? Something happened, right? Acts 2 makeover, right? And then in Acts 2, We read, therefore, let all those of the house of Israel assure you that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard it, the Bible says they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, 
Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children, and to all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Peter is speaking with boldness, right? And he's speaking the wonderful words of God. We read earlier on that he was speaking the wonderful words of God. And the Bible tells us that they were cut to the heart. When a person who can't speak very well speaks, are you cut to the heart? You are not right. So it tells us here that Peter got a supernatural, exceptional speaking ability. One that was so convincing that these people were asking, what shall we do? Right? The same Peter who was lying, who lied three times. <laughs> the same Peter who lied three times, right? The same Peter who was among the group of disciples who wrote off the testimony of the women as old wise tales, right? They didn't believe in them. That's what, that's what the Bible says. Now he's speaking to the point that these authorities were cut to the heart. So when the Holy Spirit, when, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were given, Peter was given, this exceptional or persuasive speaking ability that started to, to share the goodness of God with people who were unlearned. Okay? And we also see here that Peter is talking to the authorities and he's accusing them, you crucified him, you killed him, um, your hands, it is, it is, we read earlier on. He has a supernatural boldness. He's not, he's not afraid anymore. And he was not afraid even to the point of death. <coughs> right? Even when they threatened him that they were going to kill, kill him because of the gospel, which they eventually did, he did not stop. Can you relate that one to the one by the fire? What happened? Extreme makeover, right? Um, so, in, in Acts 2, verse 41 to 43, 46 to 47, we see the second most important significance of the day of Pentecost, the birth of the New Testament church. It says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That's Peter's word, right? Were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. That is the birth of the New Testament church. Okay? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The second significance of the of the day of Pentecost is that that is the, when the church was birthed. That is when the church as we know it today was born. So we could say that today we are not only celebrating God coming to make his wedding place fully in us, we are also celebrating the birthday of the church. All because of the day of Pentecost. All because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, Another significance of the day of Pentecost is that that's when the gifts were unleashed. That's when every gift that had already been promised and given by God started to be released from, from the inside out, from inside the disciples. Um, Acts 3, verse 1 to 9, we're talking about Peter and, J and John. They are going to the temple. They see a certain man laying from his mother's womb. And then Peter beckons to the man, look at us. The same Peter, the lying Peter. Now he's saying to a lame man, look at me. He's saying, I have the answer to, your, to all your problems. I have your healing, look to me. How bold, how audacious, right? And then the Bible tells us, then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he not only said that, he goes on and he picks up this, can you imagine? <laughs> Would you do the same? This man has been lame, right? From his mother's womb. And you say to him, rise up and walk, and then you step out and you start to pick him up. I would think what happens if he just falls. <laughs> <laughs> it would be such a 
that he has seen, right? Yeah. And then he says, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so, leaping up, he stood and um, walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Can we see how they are now operating in the gifts? Right? That is the, the third significance of the day of Pentecost. It's, it's when the gifts were unleashed. It's when everything that was locked up on the inside was released to, to minister to people on the outside, right? Uh, the fourth significance of the day of Pentecost is, is that's when Christ manifested in boldness, right? Um, Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, 7 to 14. Um, they are asking him, by what power? And by what name have you done this? They're asking Peter, right? Have you healed this man? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So he's not talking to ordinary citizens here. He's talking to the rulers and the elders, right? And he says, if, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, <laughs> and he's rubbing it in, whom you crucified, <laughs> whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. Right? He's talking to the, it's like talking to the king or the president, or the, and you're saying, you rejected him, you killed him, you denied him, right? And then he says, um, it has become the cornerstone. And then he goes on to say, no, is there salvation in any other? For there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they said that they had been uneducated and untrained, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. In other words, they could see Christ expressing himself through this man. So now they are beginning to be the manifestation of God on earth, right? They are beginning to be the outpouring of the indwelling Christ to those around them. Okay? Um, we go on to see the fifth significance of the day of Pentecost. It's when Christ started manifesting in healing signs and wonders. Uh, X5. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done amongst, among the people. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sea out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by a clean spirit, and they were all healed. The same Peter, the same lying Peter, the same fearful Peter, <laughs> the same Peter who lied in his lying. <laughs> now just his shadow, the Bible says. He didn't even have to touch them. He didn't even have to speak to them. Just his shadow was bringing these sick people to wellness. Can you see how Christ started to manifest in his fullness through these men when they were filled with the Holy Spirit? So now we want to address the question. We could go on and on with this before and afters, but I think we can, we can all agree that the after was, <laughs> was so different from the before that you could have thought they are different men, right? Okay. So who is this Holy Spirit? I read a book by a man called William Barclay. And I like the way he summarizes who this Holy Spirit is. And, and when, we, when, I, when, when I was going through the teaching and I was hearing him describe the Holy Spirit in all these different descriptions, I, I begin to desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit because of the way he was packaged or presented by this man. He says, the Holy Spirit is the helper of man in situations in which man by himself cannot go. He is that one. 
who will make you cope in situations where you think you may not cope. <coughs> right? He says he's the kind of comfort and consolation in distress, which keeps a man on his feet when, if left to himself, he would collapse. Wow. Amen. Who do you want him if he's presented that way? <laughs> He says he is the enabler of men to pass the breaking point and not break. This is the Holy Spirit. Hey? He says he is the one who makes you more than a match for any situation you will ever meet in life. It's the Holy Spirit. Right? And he is the maker of champions out of nobodies. We just, we just did the case study of one nobody in the outside of Peter. <laughs> he was a champion, right? And he died for Christ. Right? And he says, he's the one who turns what is of Jesus and makes it your reality. The Bible says Jesus went about doing good, preaching and teaching and healing, right? And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes you do that. Right? He says he's the one who turns theology into practicality. Amen. He's the one who, you know, when, we were, when, we were, when I was in A level in our biology class, we would be taught about this, these frogs, you know, how the macho, you know, the makeup of the, inter the internals of the frog. And then we would go into the lab and get frogs, the real frogs, and we would dissect them and who, who did biology at Do you remember that? We, yeah, we opened them. You're opening frogs up. Well, you, don't, you don't do that anymore. You're just learning theory. Oh, no. <laughs> we used to literally do it in the lab. We would open it up and we would separate the intestines. You, you would have to pin them and label them. It was an exam, right? <laughs> so he's, the Bible is telling us that here yeah, that Everything that we have learned about Jesus, the theory of Jesus, becomes practical with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow. It says he's the prisoner's strength and weakness. He's the counsel for the defense. He's the one who, who defends us. We never have to fight our cases. He's the one who does the fighting for us, right? Um, it says, um, he's the one who exhorts us to noble deeds and high thoughts. From the flesh, you don't get that exhortation. But the Holy Spirit will exhort you to noble, noble deeds and high thoughts, right? And then the Bible says, um, he's the presence and power of the risen Christ in all to whom will receive him. Right? And he says, uh, he is the running call sending fearful soldiers into battle and exhorting troops before enduring a fight. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, he's presented that way. Mm. You cannot deny him. Mm. Can you? No. And then he says he is the infusion of courage into the faint-hearted. Amen. And he's the one who works on the inside when no one and nothing else can reach. Amen. That's my Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you can make it yours too. Yeah. Wow. And that Holy Spirit is the one who God promises to all believers. Right? We read in Acts 2, 38 to 39, then Peter said to them, Repent and let everyone of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children, and all who are afar, are we far from Jerusalem? Yes. Are we far from Israel? Yes. Are we far from wherever? <laughs> <laughs> so the promise is to us, right? He's saying that man who see being really put up there is yours for the taking, right? And that is why we find Paul, the apostle of grace, when he's praying for the church, when he's praying for yourself and myself. He's, when you look at all his prayers in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, and Colossians 1, he's talking about the issue of the Holy Spirit. He's, the only thing that apostle Paul prays about concerning the church 
is that we might be filled with light. Is that we might be filled with light by His Spirit in our inner and light. Let's read Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 23, one of the call and prayers. He says, uh, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, I don't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Last week we, we, we read from Isaiah uh, about the seven spirits of God. We said he's the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, right? He's the spirit of the Lord. He's the spirit of Lordship. He's the spirit of might, right? So he's the same spirit that Apostle Paul is talking about here. He says that to, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, um, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him on his right hand, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every man that is in and that we may be full, filled with all the fullness of him. That, that is what the Holy Spirit can do for you and I. That is what Apostle Paul is praying for, you, for us here at today's church. He's saying that we might be filled with might by his spirit in our inner man. In other words, he's saying that we might be infused or diffused with the Holy Spirit. So that we can start to tap into the supernatural and begin to manifest God here on earth, right? And then in uh, Ephesians 3, he's also praying for the church. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in earth, in heaven and in earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner men, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Last week we read about Christ, we said, in him dwelt the fullness of the God in bodily form, right? And Apostle Paul is saying that can be your testimony too. When you start to draw from his might through his spirit in your inner man, he's saying you can be filled with the fullness of God. You can, you can confidently say, when I show up, when the Holy Spirit, when we have been dipped or immersed, or when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? So my question to you today is, did you receive when you believed? Okay? And we are taking the time from Apostle Paul. He had gone to a place where he met a group of believers, and then he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I like the answer of those believers. <laughs> you know, it says, oh, but they I can't even imagine them. We've never so much as heard of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? You know, they, they think they have it all together, right? And I says, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit or not. Then Paul says, John indeed baptized, baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ. And when Paul had laid, laid his hands on him, so he goes on to explain that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, and then it goes on to say, when Paul had, had laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So these are believers who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they, they have not so much as heard. I like the wording. They have not so much as heard about the Holy Spirit. I think they're even kind of boasting, right? Um, but Apostle Paul says, yes, there is something called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we need it. And I think the conversation went as far as them saying, oh yes, we want this man. Who will bring, him, uh, who will bring any man through the breaking point and not break? Mm -hmm. Who will keep a man standing in situations where he would otherwise stumble and fall? <laughs> and Apostle Paul is telling us uh, in the earlier scripture when he's talking about that we may receive the fullness, uh, the fullness of the Godhead, right? That we may start to walk in his fullness. He's saying 
the way you receive the Holy Spirit is the way you're going to receive any gift from God. He's saying the way you receive or the way you perceive the Holy Spirit is the way you're going to perceive anything that you're ever going to receive from God. Right? So my question to you is, did you receive when you believed? Did you receive when you believed? And if you did receive when you believed or after you believed, I still have a question for you. If you were filled once, are you being filled continually? We read from Acts 4, verse 22 to 31. Apostle Paul is saying we must be filled and filled again, right? Again and again. And being let go, they went to their own, own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had prayed in the place where they were assembled, this is after Pentecost, right? The place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So this is, a, this is I don't know, much later than the first feeling, right? And what we can learn from that passage of scripture is that they were filled once, but they continued to be filled. So God is saying, we must be filled and filled again and again and again. I like, I like how Apostle Peter was responding to that quip that the, uh, the disciples were drunk. And he was equating alcoholic drunkenness to the drunkenness of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, this man are not drunk as you perceive. I like him in the language. This man are not drunk as you perceive. It's only the third hour. It's <laughs> 9 o'clock a.m. Yeah. I think in, in those days, people didn't did drink at night, right? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was equating that the two forms of drunkenness, right? When a person gets drunk, do they stay drunk forever unless they talk up? <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to be persistently and consistently drunk, you have to keep turning up, right? So you don't get drunk and keep, you, you don't stay drunk after getting drunk once. If you want to continue to be in this drunk and stupor, you have to keep chopping up, right? It's the same with the Holy Spirit. We can be drunk on our first baptism. But, but God is saying you must continue to be drunk, which means you must continue to drink, right? And so the question is, the first question is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? If the answer is no, then today is your day. And then you go on to say, but when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, did you continue to drink? If the answer is no, then today is your day. Um, one of my favorite writers, I'm sure you can tell from my course that I'm really old school, right? Smith <laughs> Wiggles, <laughs> well, he says, the only safeguard from defaulting to our natural mind through which we can receive nothing from God is to be filled and filled again with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's saying if we, if we are not filled and filled again, we will find ourselves going back to where Christ found us. Just like the disciples did. He found them fishing. He found them right where he found, we initially found them, right? We will defect, we will default to the same if we don't continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. So my invitation to all of us today, on this day of Pentecost of 2024, is that we must come and drink. Let's drink. Let's drink and get drunk. <laughs> we want to get drunk. And so I'm going to invite, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? The Bible says, we read last week from the book of Luke, that all we have to do is ask. All we have to do is ask. And so today, if you want that man, that helper of men, in situations in which men by himself cannot go, mm -hmm. that kind of comfort and conservation and distress, which keeps a man on his feet, if, when if left to himself, he will collapse. 
that enabler of men to pass through breaking point is not the area. The one who makes us more than a match for any situation or any circumstances. God is saying, come and drink of me. And then you will start to manifest the fullness of the body, which is involving you today, right now. Shall we rise? We started asking even when, before we could talk. Sometimes our asking was just a year. And our mom would know oh, she needs water, she needs, she needs milk. She... We have been asking. Some of us are more than six decades. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Okay? And as we ask, let's open our mouths and allow the Holy Spirit to give us actions today. The Bible says when we are speaking in tongues or when we are praying in tongues, it says we are praying the perfect will of God. It says we are speaking the perfect will of the Father. It says we are speaking the mysteries of God. The secrets of our heavenly home. Let's ask and receive this morning. Let's pray. You can just open up your hand and believe you receive. And if you've received already, that believe that you receive again. And he will start to give you his beautiful language. A language that is unknown to the devils and his and his cohorts. A language that is only known by your father. Open up and speak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Never spoken in tongues. Just open your mouth and let your tongue loose this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning for every hand that is raised today. We are expected to receive from you today, Father, because if you could give us Christ, the best gift of all, and if you could give us the Holy Spirit, what could you withhold from us today? And so I pray for every need that is present here today, Father. <coughs> we thank you because you are perfecting everything that concerns us. You are meeting us at each and every one of our points of need. Thank you that you are manifesting in your power, in your strength, in your might, in every situation that is raised to you this morning. We just want to thank you that you are looking over your word to perform it. Thank you that your word has not gone forth to come back to you, boy. It is accomplishing your purposes, fulfilling your plans and purposes for our lives. Thank you, Father, that the testimonies that are going to come from this day are that the Lord has died for us. Now we will receive testimonies from everyone whose head is raised that this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. We just want to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit today. And we continue to drink and to drink and to drink some more. Thank you, Father, that we want to walk in your influence. We don't want events and encounters. We want to live under the influence today. And so we commit this morning that we will daily come to the water and drink. We will drink of the Holy Spirit, the one who leads us into all truth, the one who shows us things to come, the one who is our ever present. Help me time of me, the one who opens the eyes of our understanding, that we may know and remember what we need to remember at every moment of our lives. We just want to thank you today that we are acting as we are Thank you for every answered prayer today. Thank you for every breakthrough, Father. Thank you that you are showing yourself strong and mighty in every life that has raised its hands today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Mark, for this one, for this one of the ceremony, and for ministering to everyone. Amen. I do know that the Lord's speech has a half-life. What a half-life is in the Father's case, when you take an aspirin, for example, the time it gets to be aspirin to get out of your body and go below a, a level that it stops working is called the half-life. So it's like a period of maybe a few hours or a day. So that's what I'm saying. I do know that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is a half-life that if you're infilled today, it will get to a point where after some time it's not adequate to work in your life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So thank you so much for that, Pastor Mike. Um, before we go into our usual uh, period of discussion, um, let's just go through our Communion. I hope our elements are ready. Amen. Amen. Right. My question today, since is, how is Christ known to do it? Um, and how does he want to be known to you? Um, I'll read from Luke 20, verse 31, verse 30 to 31. Um, this is a story where the disciples were going, were on the road to Emmaus, and they met with Jesus and did not. Uh, in recognizing. Right, this is the story where the disciples were going on the road to a mass and they met with Jesus but did not recognize him. Joining them at um, the supper table, Jesus took some bread and gave things. Then he broke some bread off and gave it to them. Just then, the men were allowed to recognize him. But when they saw who he was, he disappeared. So saints, uh, people normally uh, know people from their facial, uh, you know, from their face or from their voice or from how tall they are. But in this case, these guys were working with Jesus for a very long time, but they did not uh, see that it was Jesus. Amen. So... My question is, why did he not want them to know him through other ways? But he want, let's, let's see um, yeah, 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 further and, and, and read another, another verse as well. Right. 
Jesus also says to Thomas, Come, put your finger through my pierced hands. Look at my hand and feel my side. Stop doubting. Amen. So here we also see that uh, Thomas also had the chance to look at his hands and to touch the holes which were in his hands. Just as uh, when these guys were on the road to Emmaus, when he broke the bread, obviously they would see his hands and they would see those nail pierced hands. So tonight as we partake, this morning, sorry, as we partake, this is my message to you that Jesus wants us to know him through the cross. Amen. He wants us to know him uh, because of what he did at the cross of Calvary for us and what happened later. If we read 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, Paul says, um, For a while I was with you and I was determined to be consumed with one topic. Jesus, the crucified Messiah. So this is what Paul was also consumed with. Knowing Jesus through the crucifixion, through the crucifixion. And this morning I'm saying to us, we also need to focus on the same thing. Let's focus on the crucifixion, what it did for us, what it gave us, amen, and what Jesus went through for us, and what it means to you and me today. Amen. So shall we begin? I'm sure you can take a screenshot or you can write it on a piece of paper. Amen. Right. Um, Genesis 8 verse 22 in the Amplified says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Amen. This is a law uh, that applies to everyone. Amen. He does not choose who you are, just as if you go on top of this building and try to jump, he won't choose who you are, you will fall straight to the ground. And this is basically a law. Right, let's go to another law as well, in 2 Corinthians 6 to 7. But before I go to that law, I want to uh, tell you what happens when you farm. I'm sure we have a few farmers in the house here. One, our very own pastor. Right. Um, Right. When, we, when someone farms, they don't just decide when they go to their field that are going to grow uh, beans. Okay. They plant for it, they buy the seed, they buy the chemicals, fertilizers, they uh, prepare the land in accordance to the type of seeds they want to plant. Amen. They water the seed and they take care of the seed until it comes time when they can harvest that seed. So I think the same is for our giving as well. That when we give, we need to plan for our giving. We need to see where we want to give, how much we're giving, and we also need to water our seed, amen, through prayer, through what we speak, and uh, so that our, our giving can give us a return of 60 to 100 fold, amen. And, uh, and as a farmer plants as well, a farmer just doesn't throw seeds. Amen. A farmer will go and they will dig a, is it a farm or something? From year to year, so you, when you go to those big farms, you see straight lines of, you know, wheat or corn or whatever, which means someone has done that in a structured way. So our giving also needs to be done in a structured way for us to get maximum uh, Harvest. Amen. So lastly, I will read 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 7. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctant or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So again, 
This is again a law. Amen. A farmer is not forced to plant a certain crop. They plant what they've purposed in their heart, what they want, so that they reap exactly what they have planned to, to reap. Amen. So is we can give. So shall we take the opportunity to give to the Lord? Amen. Amen. So thank you so much, Pastor, for for this wonderful message. Amen. Amen. Uh, after your sermon, I don't know when, what to call myself. Whether to call myself lying, fearful, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe all those are blind. All the above. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So it is the time that we get the opportunity to share with the saints what has stood out to us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I was thinking the same Pastor Moses that sometimes we the disciples <laughs> all the time. Then I have a disciple, sometimes I have a disciple, and she answered me because you are not constantly being filled. I'm not talking up. So therefore, I find myself fearful, doubtful, lying, all those things that the disciples were before the Holy Spirit. So I just did say that, you know, if you're not careful, you will go back to the old things. Being baptized, born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you're not careful, if you're not popping up, you can go back like they have gone back to fishing. Uh, so it's, it's the thin feeling after you receive it. It's also very really important to continue being filled with the Holy And for me, I can say, I, I walk away to be saying, why? I just want to feel like I want to be constant, consistent with the Lord. I'll be purposeful about drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like, I, I stay in line. And I love the, when you share uh, that, that part of the book from William Buckley. And there's a part he said, um, there's a friend, a prisoner's friend, uh, in the council of defense, something like that. And I was reminded of this text one which he, he is practically like, like, he's practically our council of defense, our defense. All that he listed is really practically like that in our lives. Um, so I think most people know that I work for a ministry that is a Bible college. And uh, some years back, I think around 26, we had uh, one of our first one students calling in and saying, you know what, I need there. Uh, a very good man, a very good character. Said, uh, I was coming from the Hawaiian bus and I fell uh, asleep on the wheel and I veered off the road and I uh, crashed into three fenders. Mm. One of them died on the spot, one of them was critically injured. Once one of them died on the and he needed our prayers because now he's going to court and the court will decide what to do with him. And so we prayed with him and months later he gave us the testimony that on the day of sentencing, on the day that we were going to give judgment, he said when I was sitting, the, uh, where my, I saw where my lawyer was supposed to be standing, I saw Jesus standing there. And the next thing that happened to him was like he was in the pew to sleep, he just slept throughout the court proceedings he was sleeping and when he woke up they were passing the sentence and they gave them uh, some days in community service because they said they, they, they saw that he's a good man and all that but it could be only be the Holy Spirit who was his defense so when, when you talked about our counsel of defense he's practically saints like that when we need him who could get away with community, community service who, which lawyer could make you get away with community service, but it can only be our, our prisoner's friend, our counsel of the faith. So when we are going through that list, I say, yes, he is practically like that in our day to day life. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Zulu. Uh, amen. Saying so there is hope for us all because of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was powerful, powerful. And I, I don't have much to add. So she, she, she gave an example of biology. So <laughs> I, I'll give an example of physics. That is balance. And physics, for those that did physics, I don't know what, what level I, I 
years left. But uh, there was Isaac Newton's three forces of motion. I'm just going to read Newton's third law of motion. If you don't remember it, then maybe when you didn't know it, maybe you might just pick it from here. It says, for every action, there is an equal and opposed reaction. That's Newton's third law of motion. So if, you're, if you push something, there's always resistance. Through friction. That's why you need to push more. If you don't, if you stop pushing, it stops moving. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just, me, I'm, I'm, I'm to push for the name, what is present, continuously be filled and be filled and be filled. Right. But if you are not filled, the motion will stop. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? We are living in this world where there is an equal and opposite reaction mm -hmm. trying to stop us from what? Getting the benefits of the body's mm -hmm. So that was a powerful reminder. I need to continue to continuously be filled mm -hmm. so that I overcome this force, which is the, the opposite to our loved ones. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, saints. Amen. 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 If you were not people that would hear from God, we would not be here in the way that we are here today. And also, if you were not people that are led of the Spirit or led of God, you would not allow even other church members even to give the way to your own spirit. Because for me personally, everyone who comes here. I receive and I'm just seeing the Lord like um, give me a break on top of another break where the Bible says a precept upon another precept, a break upon another break, a layer upon another layer. So this is what I'm realizing and I'm discovering as I'm in this church. So that's why I'm saying thank you for being led of God. And uh, my prayer is that may you continue. Amen. May you continue being led by the Spirit. Amen. 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 Um, as you were sharing, um, uh, Pastor Mike, since last week and this week, I think my takeaway actually is with the, you, you mentioned something like the Holy Spirit, like the indwelling, uh, the indwelling um, of God in us. It should be something that should be continually. So which means Consciously, I have to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Every moment. Because uh, when we look at uh, uh, Apostle Paul, 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 not our Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, <laughs> <laughs> when he said, no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Because he start, I think he starts by saying, um, the life no, what does he say? I am, I am crucified with Christ. And no longer I. I tell I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So we are saying it's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus living in you by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So which means I shouldn't give you a chance to use my own mind, my own logic. I should allow the Holy Spirit to guide me, to lead me, to give me what to say. Because I remember when we were talking about um, uh, that day when the, 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 the disciples, disciples and disciples, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they started speaking from the utterance that the Holy Spirit was giving them. That really ministered to me. So which means whatever that I need to say, I have to hear from what the Holy Spirit is, is, is saying. So which means I have to make a choice. Before I open my mouth, I have to hear what God is saying. 
This is how this word was ministering to me. So which means whatever that I was going to speak, it was not of mine. Just like when, uh, what's, what's his name, Peter, when he said, he <laughs> to my words. He was saying my words, but they were his because, not his as Peter, but his that are coming from the Holy Spirit, that are coming from God. And uh, hey, I said, what? I don't know. I don't know if I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm still digesting. And maybe the other question that came to mind when I was sitting there, which is also maybe another question that maybe one of us in the, in the crowd is asking. Say, so how do I stay filled with the Holy Spirit? And I can give a testimony. Please don't laugh at me. <laughs> Last week on, when was it? I don't remember. When we started this series, actually, I was working in Kenneth Kaunda, that railway avenue. So I saw a blind, blind hobo He's sitting by the bed where they sit. And I walked past him. Then I said, if I believe, that's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I was practicing. <laughs> so I said, if Jesus is in me, then it means I can also heal the blind. <laughs> Honestly, I had passed through. And I said, let me go back. Wow. And I went back. I prayed with this God. And I said, go. Three times I prayed. And I said, go open. And I said, I can't see. <laughs> then I said, okay, go. I'll come next time. Definitely I'm going next time. <laughs> but this message today is telling me that I had the great knowledge of knowing that Jesus can heal. And Jesus is indwelling me. Mm -hmm. But I was not filled up to the brim. Mm -hmm. I was not saturated mm -hmm. that I could bring healing to this woman. Mm -hmm. But I know all things are possible. Mm -hmm. If only I would be saturated, mm -hmm. I would be filled to the brim, then I would be able to heal the blind. Mm -hmm. I can see everything possible with God. Mm -hmm. If only I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's comparing being drunk with wine with being filled with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, he's saying, don't be drunk with wine, but you can be drunk with the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, this is how you get drunk. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Jesus, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. That is how you stay drunk. Mm -hmm. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Giving thanks always for all things. It is, it is. So that, that, that is how we stay drunk. And the Bible tells us that when we pray in tongues, we are giving thanks well. So the one size fits all answer to this question, to the question, is just pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. Continually play, pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, you are drawing from the wells of your salvation. Mm -hmm. That's how we draw from the wells of our salvation. Mm -hmm. That's how we draw from the fullness of the Godhead which dwells in us in bodily form. That is how we, we become Christ with skin or bones. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor. I think what also came to my mind is the, in the book of Acts when um, Peter visited Cornelius' house that as he was speaking the gospel uh, 
the Holy Spirit just came and fell on everyone who was a believer in that show. Without even one of them having asked for it. So basically that's what it is that has been ministered to the Lord as the Pastor Mark says. The Holy Spirit will be feeling us, feeling in us. Continuously. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Yes. Good to be back here to be among the saints. Thank you for being my life. <laughs> <laughs> I always pray every day when I, every time I come into church, I say, God, please just don't make him disrupt the service. <laughs> 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 but he continues to me. <laughs> uh, so coming here today and hearing the word, I'm so grateful to be part of this ministry because um, today's service answered a lot of questions that I've been having. Uh, I've been asking myself to say, I used to be like this. I used to, be, I used to do this, I used to do that. And I was trying to understand why it is that I'm not operating in the day that I used to be. And I've been reading and I'm reading a lot of books actually of the Holy Spirit. So it was very good for me to be here and to also listen to this and then also learn. Um, and um, so one of the things that I was trying to marry the things that I've been learning and what I also learned today. So as I was reading, I was reading this book called um, the theme of, the name of the book is the Holy Spirit and you. And one in one of the chapters, uh, the author says, the Holy Spirit, that's not his name. That's an expression of his character. He's the Holy Spirit. So if I have to say Tanya, like if someone says Tanya, I will turn, right? If someone says Tanya, do this, I'm going to get up and do that. But now the Holy Spirit, his name is not the Holy Spirit. So if you say Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, do this, like the Holy Spirit acts us to the name of Jesus. So that's the, that's the way that he operates. So if you want him to, to work or to, to, to if, if you, we have him in us and to get him to, to, to open it, you need to, to call on the name of Jesus, to command him using the name of Jesus. And I'm just going to uh, reference that to Mark 16, verse 17, which reads, and this sign, this is after the they received by the Spirit, right? He says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall shake up serpents. It goes on and on and on. So he's talking to people that have the Holy Spirit. But for them to activate the Holy Spirit, you activate it by the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit answers in the name of Jesus. So I just want to appreciate that. We are so happy to be here. We learned a lot, and I want to thank you guys for coming uh, this this Sunday. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? <coughs> Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful day. Father, we want to thank you for what we've learned today. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives every day. We thank you for the name of Jesus, the name that's above all. All, all names, the name that's above all authority, all dominion, all rule. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit, as we have learned, answers to the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Father, we have the, the, the use of that name, my Lord, my King. And we thank you, Father, that we will use the name of Jesus in every situation that is out of line in our lives and in the lives of others. Yeah. Father, we also Thank you for good health, for provision that you've given to each and every member of our church. Father, we also speak health to each and every member of our church. And Father, we also thank you for a prosperous week that's coming ahead of us. We commit the week to you. We thank you for appointments that we need to increase and increase only. And we rebuke the devourer, we rebuke the devil for any of his plans that he may want to, to throw spanners in any aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you as we go home, we speak, we declare genuine message, 
We glorify you, my King. We speak in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.